Good afternoon. My name is Lori Zabata, and I'm a proud JWU alumna and the Director of Alumni Relations at Johnson & Wales University. Thank you for joining us for today's session, JWU Connects, Alumni C-Suite Executives and Their Leadership in 2020. We are thrilled to bring you this program featuring outstanding alumni who have risen through the ranks of their respective companies or started their own, and now are among the key decision makers at their organizations. We are grateful they have taken the time to be with us today to share their experience, expertise, and to answer your questions. Questions can be submitted throughout the session, utilizing the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. These questions will be posed to our panelists during the Q&A section of the presentation. I'd now like to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Maureen Dumas, Vice President of Advancement and University Relations. Maureen has been a higher education professional for the past 30 years. She has held numerous leadership positions throughout her career, including Dean of Admissions, Vice President of Experiential Education and Career Services, and her current role as Vice President of Advancement and University Relations. Throughout her career, she has served on numerous committees and task forces related to the issues of higher education. Maureen has presented at multiple conferences on the topic of assessment and student competencies in experiential education including serving as keynote speaker at the New England Association for Cooperative Education Annual Conference on the topic of innovative strategies for identifying and mitigating risk in experiential learning. And she served as a panelist at the New England Board of Higher Education Academic Officers Colloquium, focused on assessment and evaluation of experiential education. Maureen received her undergraduate degree from St. Anselm, college, a master's degree from Boston University, and a doctorate from Northeastern University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Maureen Dumas. Thank you, Lori. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm proud to be joined by our esteemed panel and excited for you to hear today's discussion. I would like to welcome our panel and all of our guests for this program. We have in attendance JWU leadership, including Chancellor Rooney, President Richards, and President Bernardo Souza. We also have Johnson & Wales students, faculty, guests from Coca-Cola, Aramark, What's Good, Flick, and Gestalt Diagnostics. Lastly, we have prospective students interested in Johnson & Wales joining us today. It is quite a diverse group of individuals. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce each of our panelists. I will start with Tanika Cabral, class of 1997. Tanika is the Vice President, New Business and Partnership Sales of the Coca-Cola Company and Chief of Staff for the Food Service and On-Premise Office of the President. Her 22-year 22 tenure in the Coca-Cola system spans across customer operations, marketing, commercialization, channel strategy, and customer marketing. As a passionate advocate for women in business, Tanika previously served as the global president of Women's Link, the company's 6,000 member business resource group focused on professional development of women across 70 countries. Tanika was the recipient of the YWCA Corporate Women of Achievement Award for work done to uplift women and girls. She is also the president of the executive council for the Harvard Debate Council Diversity Project sits on the Coca-Cola Company's Multicultural Leadership Council and is a member of the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Next, I'd like to introduce Lisa Jean Clifford, class of 1991, COO and Chief Strategy Officer of Gestalt Diagnostics. Lisa has spent more than 20 years in the healthcare industry and high tech industry. Her experience includes strategy development execution, marketing, business development, and product management. She has worked in key marketing and business, business development roles at leading healthcare solution vendors, including McKesson and IDX, which is a GE healthcare system. Lisa is an industry expert who is widely published in Advance, Medical Laboratory Observer, Clinical Lab Products, CAP Today, Health Data Management, Health Management Technology, and Forbes Magazine. She has authored a book on XML, and she has presented educational and thought leadership sessions at healthcare industry conferences. Next, I'd like to introduce Gary Crompton, class of 1987. Gary is the president of Business Dining at Aramark. 
Gary joined Aramark in 1991 and has worked his way through the ranks ever since. His previous roles saw him developing global accounts and enhancing existing client relationships. In 2013, he earned Aramark's inaugural Joseph Neubauer Award for Outstanding Service, Innovation, and Enduring Impact. Gary was the executive sponsor of Aramark's Women's Business Resource Network and served on the Corporate Council of the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia Foundation. He also served on the Board of Directors of the Women's Food Service Forum and was a member of the organization's executive committee. I'd like to now introduce Scott Davis, class of 1980. Scott is the CEO of Flick International Corporation. Scott began his career with Flick in 1989 and was promoted to vice president in 1993 and to president and vice president of operations in 1998. He became president in 1999 and chief executive officer in 2015. He is responsible for all aspects of the business. Prior to joining Flick, Scott was recruited by Whole Foods Specialty Markets and for four years spent the majority of his time designing, building and renovating restaurants prepared food operations and production kitchens. Scott served as a member of the corporation for Johnson & Wales University and was an adjunct faculty member for the Hospitality College. Last but not least, I'd like to introduce Matt Totora, class of 2015. Matt is the chief CEO and co-founder of What's Good, a farmer's market and delivery service headquartered right here in Rhode Island. Matt founded What's Good in 2014 while he was still a student at Johnson & Wales to localize our food system. Today, What's Good connects hundreds of thousands of people to their community's food sources by enabling hundreds of farmers markets and thousands of local food vendors with e-commerce and next day delivery conveniences throughout the United States. Matt is also a combat veteran who served 10 years in the US Navy. Matt, thank you very much for your service. I'd like to welcome all of our panelists. Tanika, I'd like to start with you. When did you realize the pandemic was about to impact your day-to-day -day life and work? What immediate actions did you take and how ready was Coca-Cola to adopt these actions? Man, Maureen, it feels like a lifetime ago, but that was just March. <laughs> I know. <laughs> It was, it was March and you know, I can remember coming back into the States from a business trip abroad and it was late February. And as I was boarding the plane, I watched every passenger in front of me answer a very intense list of questions. And depending on how they answered, they would either board the plane or if they were high risk for COVID, they would be shuttled to a room and not allowed to get on the plane. And at that moment, it became very real for me. It had been sort of a far off situation up to that point. And the very next week, I moved into the role as chief of staff of food service for the Coca-Cola company. And it became my, my responsibility as chief of staff to address the issue and form an agile team. And um, we immediately sprang into action, right? And so there were a number of things that we did and obviously it impacted the industry. But when you think about food service, when you think about hospitality, when you think about the way the entertainment industry was impacted, it was devastating. And so we had to work very quickly to develop a strategy. We really thought about how these businesses would need to adapt, right? Anticipating traffic declines, anticipating closures, and knowing that there would be a shift um, to, and Matt, I know you'll talk about this later, but a shift to takeout and pickup and, and delivery. And we knew that consumers would need reassuring strategies, right? And so one of the first things we did was take care of our people. It was about our people. And then we transitioned to partners and it was all sort of underpinned by our purpose. But in terms of how we took care of our people, we gave every one of our 8,000 Coca-Cola North America employees $100 to use at DoorDash, Grubhub, Uber Eats, Skip the Dishes if you were in Canada, and other meal delivery partners if you were in Puerto Rico. And we encouraged our organization to really inject some immediate economic relief into the industry. That's terrific. Sim yeah. Similarly, we partnered with people across the industry, organizations that might be on the call today, even our primary competitor, to sort of stand up an initiative called the Great American Takeout to support 
the industry to do what we could to provide some economic relief. We made donations and such as, as many of you on the call probably did. And we also launched a, a rapid resource website because we knew that our company co customers needed resources and they needed them quickly. So it was all about optimizing their takeout, optimizing their drive-through. Part of your question was about whether or not the Coca-Cola company was ready for this pandemic. And I don't know that anyone was ready for the pandemic, but ironically in late February, that business trip that I talked about, it was 250 of the company's leaders. And we came together to talk about our purpose. We connected the success of the organization to whether or not we showed up every day to live our values. And it was really about becoming a networked organization, working outside of our silos to really do what we could to uplift each other. It wasn't about COVID-19, but it's ironic how that very message is what helped us sort of make a difference and sort of refresh the world along the way. But I did all of this as I was doubling as a homeschool mom of my three children, right? So I don't know that any of us were prepared for it, but I would say that anyone who was really able to master the pivot, to navigate through ambiguity, to really bring chaos, uh, clarity to chaos um, was as successful as possible. Um, but it certainly was a time and nothing that I could have ever imagined, but really proud of the way the Coca-Cola company stepped up during that time. Tanika, that's a great answer. And you bring up a really good point. You know, not only are all of us uh, struggling professionally and making sure that our organizations are prepared and can move forward in a really unprecedented time, but many of us are struggling at home to ensure that our students, or our, I shouldn't say students, our children or our families um, are protected. Um, if you have children in school, that they're adapting to online education and that they're succeeding in this environment. So I think that's a really terrific point that all of us were struggling on both ends of our lives. I also have to commend you the fact that you went into a new role the same week that everything started to shift for us as a nation. That is quite an accomplishment. Thank you. It, it certainly was unbelievable and nothing I ever imagined. I told my boss when I moved into this role, I had no idea. We, we laugh about it now, but I'll tell you, I was better at that job than I was at homeschooling my children. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. I'm sure Coca-Cola will be happy that you'll remain there, right? <laughs> Scott, I'd like to turn it over to you. When did you realize the drastic changes the pandemic would bring to us and what immediate actions did Flick take? Uh, you know, my business, uh, a lot of my business is here in New York City, and uh, since New York is one of the first states to start to recognize the um, pandemic, um, I went to visit a location in Queens, which became the epicenter initially. And when you drive through Flushing, Queens is a very big Chinatown there that's usually boisterous with people and sidewalk vendors. It is an amazing place. And it looked like a ghost town as I drove through it to visit the client. At that point, I knew that everything had changed for the foreseeable future. So it was very early on, uh, right around St. Patty's Day. Unfortunately, we've linked St. Patty's Day to, um, to when the virus really started to, to ramp up. Absolutely. Um, to start to change everybody's lives. So we knew initially in, around the country, we were gonna have to prepare uh, for this, that it wasn't gonna be isolated to New York. And um, since we were so far down the road on technology and mobile ordering and things that would allow consumers to distance themselves, because our facilities are mostly built, about 80% of our revenue comes in one hour per day. So between conference catering and, and the lunchtime experience, about 80% of our revenue is during one hour. So these facilities are generally dense packed during that peak 30, 45 minutes of time and all of that changed. Obviously the buildings weren't being populated to the degree they were prior. So, but we, it was about convenience. What once was a priority for the consumer about freshness first, price second, convenience third, that got turned around to convenience being first. And then uh, obviously you need to have a full complement of offerings, but most importantly, it was around people being able to customize what they wanted to have when they wanted to have it and either have it being delivered to them or allow it to be collected in a frictionless environment where there was no interaction with other people, even though we're in the hospitality business and it's all about interaction with other people. So it was a complete flip around of the experience 
on how both our people engage the consumer and how the consumer engage the retail environment. So now it's 24 seven, people can order on their phones, they can come and pay uh, off their phones and take it as at their leisure, whether they're taking it home or whether they're consuming it uh, in their offices. The dining rooms are pretty much uh, ghost town that most people are not eating in dining rooms today. So that experience is very different from the consumer standpoint. I think the final point I wanna make is we always, walk, we always work towards having a safe environment for our guests and our associates and really focused on food safety. It was a, a, as it should be, primary importance. But now the focus became, how do we make, keep our people safe? Because now we were putting them in environments in which they were interacting with other people um, and their other associates. So that part of the equation really needed to be emphasized because there is a fatigue factor that sets in and you have to be vigilant, I think, on the communications front and, um, and it be a non-negotiable. We're seeing it in the NFL. I, I do uh, eight NFL sports teams and we're just seeing these facilities get shut down because of a lack of vigilance. So that's basically how we've addressed it so far. Scott, I think you bring up an interesting point. The hospitality industry is all about that in-person interaction and the shift that Flick had to make in, in many of our panelists with your organizations to be able to provide that in a way that there wasn't any in-person interaction really, I think, changes the dynamics of the hospitality industry and will probably have long-term effects. Yeah, absolutely. How did you discuss with your team as the CEO? I know Flick is across the nation. How did you stay in communication with your leadership team? Well, with mediums like this, we, we had town hall meetings every week for initially in March. People were worried about their jobs. People were worried about how we were gonna deal with keeping the environment safe. They wanted to know what their roles and responsibilities were. So we, we were communicating with them on a weekly basis and the question and answer sessions could run for an hour, an hour, an hour and a half. We never cut them short so that they could get all their questions out. Cause it was a steep learning curve just on the difference between sanitizing and disinfecting. There's a steep learning curve because the chemical component completely changes. So um, there was a lot of rigor around that. And then that really nice thing about these mediums is, is you could broadcast from a location. You could start with me speaking and then we could broadcast to a location and the frontline associates and the managers could be showing them the proper way of addressing the consumer and how to uh, train their folks in the area of PPE and how to use the products safely and carefully. So that's, I think the most important piece was communication and keeping it um, healthy uh, and taking on all the, all the hard questions. Cause I have to remember in the early days there was a fair amount of furloughing that took place and those are hard messages to deliver. We've never had a layoff in my company in 40 years. Um, so it was now something we were unprepared for. And delivering that message very fast and very truthful was critical for our people. Very challenging times for a leader. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'd like to transition to intuitive leadership. Um, you know, again, none of us could expect this pandemic. And Lisa Jean, how has your role as a leader changed at Gestalt Diagnostics, given the need to operate in the midst of a pandemic with all of the amb ambiguity that it brings and the need for agility? So that's a great question. And I think the answer or the short answer is that it changed with ambiguity. <laughs> so um, certainly not knowing what to expect, especially at the onset of the pandemic, um, not being prepared for what it meant in terms of shutdowns, how long it was going to last, um, certainly from the healthcare industry perspective, and we focus primarily on laboratories, um, the entire industry was turned upside down. Um, so really looking at leadership from both our employees, and I agree with Tanika and Scott, um, specifically, we had to look at how do we protect our employees? How do we make sure that our employees are safe? How do we make sure that they are um, in a safe environment? How do we support them with the ambiguity 
in being able to work remotely, provide them the technologies that they need in order to be able to work, um, and then be flexible with them in terms of scheduling too, because as Tanika said, you have to be sensitive to what this does to everyone's home lives as well. Everything was in complete upheaval. Um, so really looking at it as, from a holistic perspective, in looking at the company's needs, our customers and how they're changing, what their technology needs are, how their product and service is changing and how we can adapt to be able to support those needs while supporting our, our employees. Um, one of the main things we did, and, and we did see a lot of our customers have to go through uh, furloughs, especially early on in the, in the um, pandemic and, and with the shutdowns, as you know, a lot of primary healthcare services were shut down for everything except emergency needs. Um, and for laboratories, laboratories were completely turned upside down with having to quickly be able to source supplies and equipment to retrofit their existing businesses to support and quickly support testing for COVID. Um, so I can't even begin to tell you what they were going through um, and what we had to do in order to be able to support them. Our, our, our employees were working nights, round the clock, weekends, um, to be able to help our customers get up to support the testing requirements for patients um, and, and to be able to support municipalities who needed to stay operational. I'm just, you know, that's a, a, a and great power supply company for key um, essential services. And so again, you know, the leadership role really turns into more of a partnership role in those, in this environment. And that is understanding what mechanisms need to be put in place, what product strategy needs to change. Um, and, and again, how we can support our customers and our employees during that process. That's great, Lisa Jean. Thank you so much for providing that information. And I'm sure the unknown and the, um, you know, the ability to be agile in this time, because as, like, as we can all see, the testing requirements are just continuing to rise. So how do you keep up, keep up with that demand? So in, in our environment, again, it's really supporting our customers and making sure that we're making connections. In many instances, we saw, and, and Tanika mentioned this with one of your major competitors, we saw a highly competitive industry um, actually borrowing and bartering for supplies early on because the supplies just were not available um, and they were limited and factories were being retrofitted to produce um, supplies to support healthcare and laboratory and the testing um, supplies needed. And we had one customer who was extremely innovative and took over a manufacturing process right down the street from them that was um, ISO certified to manufacture swabs for themselves. And then they were bartering with other laboratories for reagents with the swabs. And, and this was just to support core testing as it was coming on board. So um, very innovative. And, and in a lot of instances, we were making those introductions. We had one customer who was short on supplies. We knew another customer had those supplies, but were short on other in other areas. And then we also partner with um, large entities like Philips and Leica, our, our strategic partners of ours. And so in those instances, we were making introductions of, of them with their reagents and, and equipment to um, our customers. So again, it really becomes a partnership. Oh, that's terrific. Thank you for that example. I think there was a lot of ingenuity that came out of the pandemic um, and people working together in ways that they never thought they would be before. So that was that was a great story to share with us. Thank you. So COVID-19 has dramatically and suddenly shifted more customer traffic to digital channels. Considering that online sales grew by 25% in a two week period in March, 2020, the profound impact of the pandemic on consumer shopping habits has increased the urgency for retailers to expand their digital presence quickly. Gary, what has Aramark done to take advantage of digital channels or digital commerce? 
Thanks, Maureen. Great question. And uh, one that's really near and dear to my heart. And we, we talk about it as a leadership team every day. Uh, you know, we, we've had online ordering and, and digital commerce uh, prior to the pandemic. You know, but what we would experience is that the customer uh, receptiveness to it was, was average. It wasn't really front of mind. And, you know, the client's desire to allow us to have direct contact with the consumer to create those relationships was spotty. Uh, but you fast forward four or five months and everyone who's working from home is now extremely comfortable with ordering online, having it delivered to the home. Uh, and th there's an expectation that we will have that. And not only do they expect it, but they expect the quality of food and they expect the quality of the interaction with the technology to be very high. So we have to revisit you know, the, the platforms that we had and really make them much more user-friendly and much more consistent with what our consumers were, were experiencing when they were working from home. Um, so we were rapidly were able to improve those platforms and make them look a lot more like what our customers Customers were used to, uh, and, you know, in the first six or seven weeks, we, we upgraded and rolled out, you know, a full digital end-to-end -end commerce platform, you know, across a thousand locations, um, really with the idea being that, you know, that will be one, if not the only option for people in many locations. And, and as it turns out, you know, close to 25% of our locations that are operating, the only way that you can get food services through our digital commerce and uh, online ordering plus so, uh, you know and, and it's not it was a combination of cashless and contact free obviously delivery and pickup and it needed to be a safe environment but one of the modules we had to also offer was you know grocery we had a full line of grocery products that could be ordered in advance we would deliver them to your office we would deliver them to the curb we would deliver them to the parking lot wherever wherever you needed those groceries <laughs> delivered we would take them there uh, and, you know, at the same time, in, in, the, in the spirit of being, you know, touchless and contactless, we implemented a number of our quick eats autonomous cafes and convenience stores where, you know, physically, as you remove the item from the shelf, it automatically fills your cart and pay for it. So there's no interaction at all. So another convenience for our customer, um, you know, so really this end to end digital commerce platform and, and really the, the, the consumer itself really moved to a player. The consumer is paramount, right? We have less people on site. They're much more sophisticated. Um, so our ability to attract those consumers that are on site and really get 100% participation versus some of the metrics we've used in the past for participation is cool. Um, and another key component to the direction that we're taking really is the work from home consumer. Right. In a lot of cases, like right now, we have significantly more consumers working from home than we're working in the office. And, and who knows where that'll end up uh, when the dust settles. But you know, our ability to engage those work from home consumers you know, and work with our clients to help them like they have an engagement with their work from home consumers is important. And we've created a number of opportunities for employee engagement with our Munch Mail customized snack box that a client will send out to work teams, to sales teams, to individual employees to say, hey, we, we remember you. <laughs> You're out there working hard for us and here's a way for us to engage you. Uh, we also have chefs that will take, take a group through building a meal together as an employee engagement process. And a lot of our clients are utilizing that again, just for a way to connect so that the work experience when you're working from home, you're not completely disengaged from the workforce, you can see your work your work partners in an environment that's not like this, just in front of a Zoom screen, maybe in front of a stove or, or something like that. So really finding ways to connect those. You know, we also are offering direct to, to home delivery of, of meals and groceries and other things with third party relationships that we have. So, you know, when we think about digital commerce and we think about the consumer being the king and queen of the, of the, of the land, um, we want to be able to service those consumers uh, and get as much of a share of their spend, regardless of whether they're working, you know, in their pajamas at home or in, you know, in business casual attire in the office. So, uh, and so far, that strategy has been very well received by both the consumer as well as the clients. Gary, it's interesting that you mentioned the um, at-home worker 
I just had a staff meeting with my team and it really was our end of the year meeting. And I thought in my mind, if this was last year, we would have had donuts and we would have had coffee and, you know, it would have been more of a, a celebration, you know, as we approach the end of the year. So I think it is really important to think about how we can um, provide those, I'll call them luxuries or niceties, um, you know, to our various teams and to our individuals as they work from home so we can create community. Yeah, and the clients I speak to are looking for really two things. How do you engage the, 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 the employees working at home? And now that they're starting to reopen and think of, thinking about reopening, you know, what processes and systems can you create to actually also attract people that want to come back? So having this contactless, safe way to deliver food and have autonomous uh, options for them to have food helps to attract people back to the office. Because there's a sensitivity about returning to the office. Uh, hopefully that will subside as time goes on. But So we need to get creative to get them comfortable, whether they're at home or whether they're in the office. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Matt, would you like to add to what we've just discussed in terms of what's good done to shift to digital commerce? Uh, yes, I mean, um, absolutely. I, I, I definitely agree with a lot with, with what uh, Gary mentioned and talked about. Um, we were digital commerce from the beginning, so there was no shift necessary. Um, definitely didn't see a pandemic coming, but uh, we, you know, we were in e-commerce and direct-to-consumer model for years prior to um, the pandemic. Um, it really uh, became a, a tipping point for consumer behavior. When we look at uh, online ordering and grocery alone, um, January of 2019, uh, roughly four and a half percent of the entire U.S. had purchased groceries online. By May of 2019, uh, well over 67 percent of the U.S. had purchased. And by August of this year, um, we would see more than 75% of the United States households purchasing groceries online. Uh, when, I, when I started the company in 2015, um, our, uh, our biggest question from investors was, will people order food uh, groceries online? You know, they thought about wanting to be at the grocery store and picking up the produce, feeling it, touching it. Um, and yeah, it, it really, you know, the pandemic just, it, it greatly uh, it exaggerated the evolution of how people think about um, getting food. It, it more or less forced people to have to think about um, ordering, you know, their groceries online and fresh produce and whatnot. Um, we are, you know, really focused on the positives of, uh, of things with COVID and pe the, pe the mid pandemic. I, I think, um, it's interesting to hear a lot of people talking about it as a past tense while, um, actually today we're, we're passing, um, actually, uh, really not good numbers in terms of what's going on with the pandemic. I think we're, we're, we're unfortunately breaking records in, in the U S and deaths. Um, the, Positives here are, um, are, are rethinking our, uh, our food system and rethinking the way we get our food. Um, one of the things that really became clear was that the, uh, you know, the, the farmers and food producers around us could um, really become vital during times of, um, you know, of, of, uh, of need where you know, the grocery store or the, the typical place you would get your food was either you know, not accessible um, for, for a variety of reasons or um, you know, the supply chains had broken down. And I think that was a, a really important thing that um, the majority of the US uh, really came to terms with in that uh, when our food travels a really long distance, there's a variety of things um, you know, that, that could cause disruption. So um, yeah, I mean, you know, digital technology is, uh, is something that's been growing prior to the pandemic. I mean, you know, it, we've, we've, we've seen Amazons and, and, uh, and big, you know, online platforms come into play like Etsy and Wayfair, um, you know, years prior to, uh, this is a, um, you know, a, a point where mobile and digital technology will, um, you know, will really be the way that, uh, the way of the future, as they say. That's terrific. And I, I think you bring up a really good point that, you know, our country is struggling at this time and we are still in the middle of it. And all of you as leaders, um, you know, still have lots of opportunity to make changes for your organization, to keep 
your team safe, um, as well as the consumer that you work with. Um, who would have thought, you know, in the United States going to a supermarket and, and seeing the entire meat aisle completely empty or the toilet paper aisle, right? <laughs> um, and I think that transition to digital commerce is going to stay with us and something that we will have over long term. So um, kudos to you and your company and to Gary for what you've done to be able to make things easier. So much has changed over the past nine months. Um, Scott, how has the consumer experience changed at Flick, knowing that safety and confidence from their perspective is a priority? What solutions has Flick provided for serving and less contact during purchases or customer interactions? Well, I think a lot of that has been discussed already in, in doing everything as an online merchant, frankly. We've gone from being in the hospitality business in, in, in large part to being retail operators and having consumers order on their phones um, and having it delivered to where they, where they may want it. Even in presentations when we're doing samplings of food, we're sending bento boxes to clients' homes for them to sample the food to, in order to make a decision on who their provider will be. So um, it, the entire thought process has changed into a kind of 24 seven set of circumstances and being able to order it in a way that's all digitally done. Um, and you're no longer buying based on what you might be craving for by seeing the food and smelling the food and just kind of judging based on your appetite. It, it, that, that model, I never thought that model would take hold. As Gary said earlier, the consumer was kind of tepid to the online experience, even though you were trying to provide convenience for them, but they've had no choice but to adopt and have done really well. I think the big thing here is simplicity. Whatever you're going to um, put in play from a digital platform, you can let it run away by having it be a, a lot of volume of choice. It, in theory, that sounds great. You're giving consumers lots of choice, but when you're starting to engage your phone to order food, um, having it streamlined and concentrating on what the high volume things are, where people are likely to choose, being more intuitive on consumer choice is really critical on having that artificial intelligence take root on how the systems are built. I think what we're wor really working on today, though, is getting ready for people to return to the workplace. Mm -hmm. uh, we think it's going to be late spring, early summer, and even then, I think the five-day work week is, at least for the foreseeable future in the office, is history. And so we need to be crafty about how we get the consumer to spend more with us uh, in the space and making sure that they believe that the space and see that the space being safe for them to be in. So now there'll be a program on their phone that'll tell them when the conference room's been sanitized and disinfected, when the bathrooms have been done the same, when, when, how to order for conference, like you're ordering room service, uh, your food will come on, um, just like room service into the conference space. Even things like AV and you, into engaging with the workspace, you'll know exactly um, how to do everything from your mobile device without having, and, and having the comfort that things have been taken care of and looked after from your device. You'll be able to check those things right from your phone. So as you're entering the workplace, where you need to be, when you need to be, what time you need to order food by, um, what time you're gonna leave the room, when the room was disinfected, all those things will now be readily available to you in a click. That, that's just amazing. And it sounds like, um, you know, so many more concerns or uh, juggling a lot of different things that you probably never thought of before. Um, you know, having that type of information and being able to provide it to your customers is really important so that they know and can feel satisfied that the room has been cleaned prior to entering. Um, but the organizational um, skills that have to go into that has got to be quite a feat. Yeah, there's a lot of challenge on the training side. You, you can't over communicate and train folks on how, how to implement these kinds of things. Uh, so that's really important. And then Obviously, every workspace is different. So as you're mapping out the workspaces with technology, it takes a, a, a lot of people just to map out the workspace so that it, you can see it on the phone. And um, so there's a lot of upfront work being done today to get ready to, for people to return to the workspace. 
Terrific. That, that sounds like good news to me. Gary, what has Aramark done to ensure the safety of your consumers? Thanks, Maureen. Obviously, the safety of the consumers and the employees was really paramount. And we, you know, we, we had a little bit of a heads up on what was happening. We were collaborating with our colleagues in Aramark, China. We were starting to get a sense for what we could what we could expect coming over. And, and, and we've always had, you know, exemplary standards for sanitation, uh, for cleanliness, all the things that we that we we do as a company, as an industry. Uh, but a lot more was added to that as far as PPE and disinfecting, all sorts of things that we were doing. And there was different municipalities and different states and different rules. So I think one of the best things we did was really how do we focus on this end-to-end -end holistic plan for how we approach COVID as well, and approach the reopening and ongoing management of these accounts. And how do we validate that everything that we do on a regular basis, which we get kudos for all the time, is actually well, well entrenched and aligned with the CDC, the WHO, all the, the and, and the local and state units. So um, one of the things that we did, I think uh, initially that, that worked out well for us was we partnered with Jefferson Health, who's a, a healthcare partner of ours, to validate as we were doing and created this Eversafe brand, which is the Aramark uh, umbrella for reopening and long-term management under uh, you know hygienic conditions and following all the statutes of it. And what that allowed to do uh, was really make sure that everything that we were doing across the board was aligned around the critical things that needed to happen, whether that was you know health and hygiene practices with PPE and health monitoring and health practices. Uh, you know, appropriate social distancing, things that you take for granted, but, you know, is there a way to make sure that across, you know, all these countries and all these states that we're, we're doing a very specific way for visual cues and how we're altering our facilities to be appropriate for, for social distancing, how we're maintaining traffic flow. Um, there was all sorts of new enhanced cleaning, sanitation, and disinfecting procedures that were required, making sure everyone was following those procedures correctly working with our vendors to, you know, what's the best product process that every day a new product was coming out. We wanted to make sure that we were uh, effectively utilizing that. And, and technology has just been, been uh, a saving grace here with, with AI and it, where it started robotics on our facilities side, uh, mobile solutions. So when you have all that going on at the same time, you know, the Eversafe umbrella really allowed us to be able to capture all those best practices with Jefferson Health to make sure that MHO and CDC guidelines and really create an end-to-end -end solution for it. And, uh, and, you know, we've been doing random customer surveys and just finished our client survey and, and you know, sanitation and cleanliness was, you know, all 98, 99% uh, across the board. And I think that has a lot to do with, with our ability to kind of look at, look at this whole this holistically end-to-end -end and validate that we're following all the proper procedures and protocols. So, uh, it's a complicated road to navigate because there's everybody has an opinion, but if you, if you really kind of stick to the guidance, uh, it worked out fairly well for us and for our consumers specifically as well, you know, as, as our, our employees are facing the same things every day in those locations and keeping them safe throughout this process this has been uh, key as well. Gary, I think you bring up an interesting point. You know, as we all were managing this, um, I think of Johnson and Wales and our leadership team, team here, we were managing campuses in four different states, which meant four different governor's opinions. And I can't imagine an organization that's in all 50 states and it, or across the country, as well as in internationally. Um, it must have been very challenging to keep up with what were the current requirements. It required a tremendous amount of communication in our, in our Aramark response group really was 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 uh, in charge of, for lack of a better word, really figuring all that out. So we had a whole group of people that really daily would be sending out updates to specific people that if you're in Philadelphia, by the way, you now can only have gatherings of 25, 50. So that level of communication was happening, you, you know, throughout the day, throughout the week. And it was very specific to your if you had an account in Minneapolis, here's what, you know, because it did come down to municipalities, yes. states, and, um, you know, I think everyone did a fair, I think the industry did a very good job of, of being able to identify um, the level of communication that you needed 
uh, and how local you really needed to, to get. At the same time, you needed to have overarching guidance and, and, and uh, guidelines, uh, but you had to get very local and very granular. I would agree. So I'm gonna transition, um, Matt. In 2019, the greatest concern for employers was hiring and retaining employees. How is this pandemic affecting the way your organization operates from a workforce development perspective? What has What's Good done to engage and retain employees during this time? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think the, uh, the interesting part about how the pandemic affected us was uh, March 17th, I, I woke up to my CTO calling me um, with a request to uh, put a bunch more server space online. Basically, we were uh, experiencing such high traffic in ordering that um, uh, our, our processing speed was, was being slowed down. And um, that was kind of, you know, the, you know, the uh, hey, good morning, you know, welcome to the pandemic kind of, uh, um, you know, first <laughs> thing, right? Like, changed. holy crap. Yeah, you know, um, and we quickly went from, to give you an idea, we, we averaged about uh, 120 orders a day in our hubs um, prior to that day. Uh, after that day, we would see 300, 400, 500 and more um, per day, uh, orders and deliveries per hub. And um, we needed people, right? And, and finding good quality people um, who, who were willing to um, you know, to, to, to come out of their homes, to come out of their safe spaces and, um, and work for the good of society and the good of the community um, was something I, I would have said was not going to be, um, was not going to be easy. And, and I, I guess I wouldn't say it was easy, but it, it definitely wasn't something that um, I, uh, I feel like we, we had to um, do anything special? We we effectively were hiring while a lot of people were laying uh, were laying people off from work, and um, and that really put us in a great position to find high quality people. We tapped into um, a, a network of of food service um, operators, chefs, um, people in the culinary world that were were kind of on the other side of the coin. Um, and we were able to hire a, a, a really great workforce in, in New England, um, the Northeast, and, and around the country and in other hubs as we opened them uh, to really find people who were, um, and I, I think it was an extraordinary time for us all to say, you know, it's, it's a human thing. It's a, you know, it's a, a desire to help others. Um, you know, the farmers and food producers were and are part of that silver lining. And I was talking about the positive things that have happened during the pandemic um, to be uh, able to offer uh, people the, um, the chance to have a good paying job with good benefits in a, a safe working environment was, um, was something that we were in the position to do. Um, we had to reform our processes a bit. Um, you know, we had 120 food producers coming to a single location on a day uh, we wanted to keep our food producers safe. We wanted to keep our employees safe. Um, and we obviously wanted to keep our customers safe as well. So, um, you know, just thinking through personal protective equipment and processes that could keep uh, everyone feeling comfortable and safe was uh, at the top of our list for how to, um, you know, how to invite people in to come join our team. And, you um, you know, it, it really was, uh, it, it was something that we were able to take advantage of and being in that situation where um, we were hiring while a lot of people were, were reducing the sizes of their teams. Thank you, Matt. Tanika, would you like to add some observations from Coca-Cola? Sure, you know, as I listen to all of the leaders on this call, you know, we, we had the same approach. Early on when we were thinking through the guiding principles for the COVID-19 Agile team, it was a people first strategy, right? And my, even my personal mantra as a leader has always been when you take care of people, they will take care of the business. And so thinking about the food service industry and what was happening to so many of our partners, it actually turned our work upside down. When you think about the day-to-day -day responsibilities of the people in our division, all of a sudden there was excess capacity 
right? And so we implemented a platform called dynamic resourcing and it allowed managers within our system to post open roles, to post projects that they needed help with because we weren't hiring at the time. And those employees with excess capacity were able to take on new work. But what was really interesting about it is you were able to take on work completely outside of the function that you were working on. As an example, I had a business development director in my department go work on our public affairs business. And we really were able to have development discussions about the importance of transferable skills, right? What transferable skills can you take from your experiences and move into maybe a completely different line of work? And in addition to that, we were really conscious of making sure our employees were connected and cared for, right? This was a troubling time, still is to your point, Matt, right? This pandemic isn't over. We were very intentional about providing flexibility so that our employees could balance work and their personal needs. There was increased collaboration and connectivity across groups. I think Scott said that he had weekly meetings and we ramped up our connectivity as well. Um, and just the care and the increased frequencies of leader connections really served us well. In fact, it was interesting. We received our engagement pulse survey results and they were higher than they were before the pandemic. And people said that they felt more connected than they ever had. And we were, and we were further apart. And so, um, you know, it was, it was interesting. And so many of those habits that were created over the first few months of the pandemic, we've implemented as, you know, normal day-to-day -day business routines. But one thing I really want to emphasize it with, with our audience in particular is the importance of the transferable skill. I had a conversation re recently with a colleague who was, who was a friend of mine, and he was saying, you know, Tanika, I've been in food service sales for over 20 years. You know, I'm a sales guy, and I'm a customer guy. And I said, you're not. You're actually great at influencing, and you're great at relationships. So let's take the function out of the conversation and talk more about those transferable skills, because from a development and career planning perspective, you open yourself up to more opportunities. So those are the conversations that we're having with our associates at Coca-Cola. How might you think differently about your career? Because the spaces that were impacted unfavorably by COVID, while those are recovering, maybe there are some other things within the organization that you can think about for your career. Tanika, that's great advice, uh, not only for Coca-Cola employees, but for all of our students who are listening and even the high school students that are on this call today, that you know the skills that you have, even if you've worked in the hospitality industry or, or any specific industry, education, healthcare, there are transferable skills that people can use in other industries. So I think that was terrific advice. Thank you. Thank you. So no one knows how long this pandemic will last. We're very hopeful that we can get back to things in the spring, but it looks like this event will change the way we work and the way organizations function going forward. Lisa Jean, how does Gestalt Diagnostics evolve? How do you plan for the next year knowing the uncertainty that we have in the future? Well, I think the main thing is that we've already really evolved. So being nimble, being able to pivot your business and your product line um, to be able to support anything, whether it's a pandemic, whether it is um, any other, I'll call it catastrophe that could happen. Um, one of the things that we did was go from being primarily a digital pathology software provider to supporting software solutions and um, mechanisms and platforms for COVID testing. And that evolved just naturally through the process of having the conversations with our customers and understanding what their needs were as they were evolving. Um, we had the skill sets in house we had the ability to develop software products um, and we had staff, as uh, other people have said, that we were committed to not furloughing or laying off. That was one of the commitments we made very early on. So when you look at transferable skills and when you look at um, what you have in house for employees who can then also pivot and change their focus, whether it's learning a new programming language or whether it's simply going from a programmed solution for digital to a programmed solution for, we developed um, a uh, admin module and a 
COVID checking and tracking application, a downloadable app for large employer groups, universities, schools, hospitals. Um, and so these employers and these hospital facilities have the ability to um, do push notifications, to do on the app real time CDC guidelines, question checking. This is all reported back to HR departments. Automatic um, programming can be put in based on the organization's um, desire. You know, you, you have two or more symptoms, don't come to work today. Um, for hospital employees, show up at this location for your COVID test. Um, you know, have you had a COVID test? Upload the results. Um, so again, being able to pivot and being able to use the skill sets that you have in-house to keep those employees um, gainfully employed uh, and, and to be able to provide services to the customers. Um, and then the other thing I think that's really important is staying positive through this. Um, so yes, we're, we're going through another spike and our, what I would call our core business is still being impacted. We did have a brief recovery for that over the summer, um, but now we're coming into another downturn. So again, focusing um, on our employees, on what their needs are, and really um, being able to retrofit some of those skill sets to the services and support of our customers on the COVID side. That's terrific. Thank you, Lisa, for sharing that information. I'm going to transition now to our question and answer session. We're doing a great job managing the time here. So the first question is from Christopher, and this is open to the whole group. What do you believe to be the lasting effects of operating in COVID in terms of food service? Touchless service, masks in the kitchen at all times? Who would like to answer that? Gary? Sure. <clears throat> I mean, I, I think there's obviously some things that we talked about today that, that aren't going to go away as far as, you know, online ordering and, and things like that. But I, but I think it, from my view and in my, in my industry, I think that the consumer has taken a very different position with, with us. Um, you know, we, we were, we've been a very client focused industry. We always, you know, kind of thought about the consumer, but the mindset now has changed to we're going to have less people, less consumers. How do you shift and really understand what is going to make the consumer experience the greatest it possibly can be and how the, it can be the most convenient? So that's a pretty big shift in, in the business that Scott and I are in I mean, as far as focusing on really understanding that the consumer is now king and queen and every decision you make needs to be around how you're attracting you know, a much broader share of consumer than what used to be the, the, the you know, the paradigm or the, you know, the, uh, the acceptable level of participation. So I think that'll be something, <clears throat> again, in our world that will change uh, forever. Thank you. We have a question from Sherry. With Southern California once again shutting down, do you think the industry, including all aspects of hospitality, Tourism and restaurants will survive after this three week or longer shutdown. Also, has anyone actually studied if this caused super spreader, if this causes super spreader events? I'm assuming she means restaurant, the restaurant industry. Matt? I'll, uh, I'll, uh, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, to address that question because I think it's, a, it's something that's on uh, pretty much everybody that I know in the food service and hospitality industry, especially all of my, my friends and network that are chefs, um, it, you know, th this, it, it, it is absolutely, um, you know, going to, um, going to have a lasting effect. I, I think the, the unfortunate reality is that this is an acute uh, evolution. So it's a, it's a, it's a very short, um, very concise period of time. We can look back to um, September 11th, we can look back to World War II, we can look back to periods in time where we say this was before and this was after. Um, part of the, 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 you know, the, the word pivot that um, so many companies and businesses and startups use, um, uh, part of what that, what, what's built into that word is the idea that you, you need to change to what the times are, are demanding. And, and I think that there are going to be a number of restaurants that are reinventing themselves. And I would just point out that, um, you know, or use an example here in, in Chicago as we're, we're launching operations here that um, we're working with restaurateurs that are reinventing themselves by the day. 
Um, there are chefs like Stephanie Izzard um, with the uh, Boca Restaurant Group here in Chicago that have uh, created a, a meal kit brand that has gone national, um, literally in the last few months have you know, reinvented themselves into something that consumers want and something that they can use their, their operations, their infrastructure, their people, their, their know-how, right? To, to now pivot to meet the, the consumer demand uh, in today's current time, you know, during the pandemic and probably long after the pandemic has, um, has subsided. Um, I think the masks and the temperature checks and those kind of things will subside. I, I, I do think that we will come out of that period to where we're, we're not all wearing masks. Do I think we'll see people forever wearing them? Yeah. I mean, we for, for years and years and years and my time in, in Asia and other places around the country or around the world, rather, um, people wore masks already. So, um, you know, hand sanitizer, right? I mean, how long has it been a uh, a, a thing where you saw hand sanitizer dispensers around buildings. Um, that was prior to the pandemic and we will see those things for sure, but they will be the lesser of probably the effect. Um, dark kitchens, ghost kitchens, those kind of things are all growing right now um, and, and probably will not go away, um, you know, with the masks and, uh, uh, and the temperature checks. Thank you. We have a question from Marquise. Do you have any thoughts overall on the job market outlook going into 2021? That's a tough question. <laughs> Anyone want to comment on that? I'll, I'll definitely uh, comment real fast. The, um, the digital world and e-commerce delivery, um, all of the functions that are kind of along with what I was just talking about with the um, you know the 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 industries that are supporting it, whether it's Amazon or 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 What's Good or Aramark or you know any of the sides of the businesses that are growing very rapidly with consumers, um, the the skills and transferable skills that people have gained in other places. We have um, uh, an architect who's operating our uh, fulfillment hub in uh, in Rhode Island who you would never really think about like, oh, I'm going to jump into fulfillment operations and delivery, but her skills and her, um, her background fit very well into what we need in, in our industry. And, and I think that if, if you're thinking about where to go, it's, it's who's playing in the digital um, e-commerce delivery and fulfillment world uh, is a great place to start. Thank you, Matt. Uh, this question is, is specifically for Tanika. Uh, it's from Tracy Ann. COVID has taken a toll on us. How are you managing and practicing self-care to be the best daily? I think that's a terrific question. That, that is a question and, and maybe someone else can give me an answer. I need to do a better job. At, <laughs> but, um, no, no, really. Uh, self-care is everything in, in this period of COVID. As I think about my personal situation where I have a demanding job, I have three children under 15, one in kindergarten, right? And so as I'm trying to juggle all of those things and be my best at work and be my best at home, what I realize is that I have to give myself grace, right? I have to give myself grace and know that there are days when I will be excellent for the Coca-Cola company and when I will be excellent for my children and maybe some things will be compromised on the other side. Um, one of the things that we did early on during the pandemic was sort of help our organization come to terms with working from home. And Scott, as you talked about what you're doing in cafeterias, I thought, I can't wait for you to do that at our Coca-Cola cafeteria because I want to get back into, into the office. But as I'm home, when I get up in the morning, I get ready for work. And I wasn't doing that early on, right? I was taking the laptop and I was putting it on my lap and I would start working. But now I get ready for work. I've purchased a treadmill with a desk on that treadmill. And so I try to get in steps as often as possible. And I'm trying to do a better job of balancing what I need to care for myself um, with everything that I need to do for my family and, and for the Coca-Cola company. And so I'm trying to be as intentional as possible to do those things because I know if I take care of myself, I'll be better for everyone else. And I give my team the same advice. Um, another thing that we did early on as my daughter and she's been good. I can't believe she hasn't popped into the screen. Um, but as our children popped into the screen, I was on a town hall with 1,100 people. And my daughter popped into the screen and waved, 
right? And she sat there and I said, you can say hello. And so I had gotten so many messages after that from people who said, both men and women, parents who said, gosh, you just gave me permission to do that. For so long, I've been shushing and, and locking my, my kid in the room, but I won't do that anymore. And so we implemented something called show and share. And so if you have a kid, if you have a pet, if you want to take us on an MTV Cribs tour of your home, you can do that, right? We, we invited them to invite us into their home. It, it made such a difference. It was something that actually came up on our engagement surveys that it sort of, it took away some of that anxiety. So those are some of the things that I'm doing, but I think I have a long way, way to go. I think those are some great examples and, and, you know, and we can all relate to them. I could tell by the reaction of all the panelists, you know, I'm not being brave today because I have McNulty, Gaby Commons, uh, McNulty Hall and Snowden Hall in my background, but you're right. You know, the kids popping in, the pets popping in, everybody's getting to know your coworkers on a more intimate level. Um, so that's probably a positive that, that has come out of this. So I'll move on to the next question. This is from Nicholas. How do you keep your team motivated despite the ongoing challenges and obstacles? Lisa, would you like to answer that? Sure, I'd be happy to, thank you. Um, so, you know, it's really about just keeping everybody engaged and these types of forums, um, being able to, as Tanika said, um, engage your family, engage your home life, let people know that you are real, that you're an employee, that you work for the company. Um, during the workday, obviously the company comes first and there are deadlines that have to be met. However, there are, these are very different challenging times and everyone needs to be flexible and understand that um, there are monkey wrenches that can get thrown into the gears. and being flexible as a company and uh, allowing the employees to understand um, that we are going to be flexible with them. And there are parents who are trying to watch younger children while they're working. They're trying to juggle homeschooling while they're working. Um, they have multiple people working from home in the same house with one office. So there's a lot of flexibility that needs to happen. And I think just letting everyone um, know that yes, there are deadlines. Um, we will be flexible with that. We will accommodate for these challenging times and we will stay engaged. We have um, on our weekly calls as an organization, we have um, a lot of props that we give to each other. And we do things like send home gifts to people. Um, so if someone meets a deadline or exceeds a goal, um, then we send a gift package and they don't necessarily know that it's coming or what's coming, but um, people have started to look forward to, okay, I've achieved my goal. Is UPS showing up today? <laughs> <laughs> Maureen, can I add to that? Of course. You know, you prompted me to think about this, Lisa. You know, we, we really have to meet people where they are. And I can remember early on talking a lot about those who were juggling homeschool. But what I also realized is there were people home alone. There's someone on my team who lives alone and her only family member here in Atlanta is an elderly parent. And, and because of pre-existing conditions, they couldn't visit one another. And so what I found is some people needed ramped up connectivity, right? That person needed us to reach out more often while perhaps that uh, homeschooling dad or mom needed us to back off a bit, right? So it was important for us to meet people where, where they were and recognize that we had to sort of customize our approach to meet the needs of the individuals and in whatever circumstances they had happening at home. That's a really great point. I'm gonna move on to the next question. This is from Christy. What are the panelists thoughts on the importance of emotional intelligence in the workplace? Is there more of a focus on this in leadership discussions? Who would like to answer this? Scott, you wanna give it a try? Um, well, I have to say that with, with so much going on today in the workplace, um, and it's not just about COVID. I think the Black Lives Matter movement's taken on a different dimension in, in our organization and organizations across the country. It, it, it is about 
having the discussions and moving things front and center and tackling the issues with your people. I think also it's really important to bring in the experts from different vantage points. We, we don't have all the answers and relying on bringing in experts that have expertise in areas such as emotional intelligence or behavior analysis, because behavior as we knew it prior to COVID and prior to the Black Lives uh, Matter movement, gaining so much positive momentum over the last few months has changed everything for our associates and how they interact with one another. So we've, we, we've really relied on bringing in professionals to help us on that and using third parties to help steer both our culture, our organization, our communication skills, and really change the way we're looking at things and viewing both our people first and as well as how commerce is going to change going forward. Not a, uh, it's, it's a, it's, it would be a very long answer to that question because it, it is a part of everything we do. Emotional intelligence is, is a part of everything we do. And to some degree, the digital commerce is, is removing some of that and it's creating a bit of a void uh, um, that people could overlook real quick, especially in hospitality, which is really, as I said earlier, all about people taking care of people. Maureen, I'd, I'd like to add something. Sure, Scott. Sure, Matt, go ahead. Yeah, so it, I, I think it, we take the approach uh, from, you know, it it really starts from a top-down approach. Um, and and that, you know, it, it always is going to come from the leadership of the organization. And, you know, the emotional tel intelligence question and, and the importance of it is uh, is never been more important, I would say. Um, whether it's the pandemic or it's the you know shelter in place or it's the at home or it's the the civil unrest, um, you know, our country, our family, our lives are all changing very rapidly, and um, and and being aware of um, of the different emotions, the different situations, the different um, backgrounds that people have within your team is um is 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 never been more important and um we've we've taken the approach of of you know number one i i i lead my team from the front um i do things before my team will do it i don't ask my team to do anything that i would not and we have we've had the opportunity to do that um from a very foundational element and and i think that um that trickles down and you see it move all the way down to um, the very, you know, the very newest team members who see that from above and, um, and it just really creates a, a positive culture and workforce environment. And, and that's how we've approached it. Um, I don't particularly you, think that the outside is, um, is, 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 is a factor for us. It's, it's kind of internal. Thank you. Well, I'm going to end the question and answer session. I, I apologize for those participants who've asked a question that we weren't able to get to. Thank you to all of our alumni for such an inspiring and informative discussion. 2020 was certainly a challenging time for all of us, but you have all shown grit and the ability to pivot quickly when needed. Your leadership can certainly be looked to by all when needing to make decisions. On behalf of Chancellor Rooney, the faculty and staff of Johnson Wales University, I would like to thank all of you. We are certainly proud of all of your ac accomplishments as alumni. Also would like to thank all of our alumni attendees for joining us and all of our guests. I hope you enjoyed hearing from your fellow alums. As the pandemic has changed everyone's lives, it also affected our students greatly. The need for financial aid and scholarship support is great. You can help support Tomorrow's Leader today with a donation to the JWU Emergency Fund. Thanks to a generous donation from trustee and a JWU parent, Dave Wilson, all gifts will be matched up to $100,000 until December 31st. Please help us meet this challenge. So if you're in a position to give, I ask that you consider doing so. We have included a link in the chat for your convenience. On behalf of our students, I thank you sincerely for your generosity. We sincerely hope that you enjoyed today's session, part of the JWU Connects family of programming. We hope that you will join us for the future programming. We have an exciting series on health and wellness beginning in the new year, including programming on immunity boosting, meditation, and a yoga series. In addition, we will continue to offer executive leadership programs like today's, where we will learn from alumni leaders. 
Lastly, we will continue to offer our popular Sip with Jaywoo series and Cook Along with Jaywoo. For all listings of full events, please visit our event calendar at alumni.jw.edu. Thank you again for your attendance. Wishing all of you a joyous holiday and best wishes for a healthy and happy 2021.